The streets will never make you grow. It's not a seed, it's a gutter. There's no happy endings in this life. So this is my message to you. The streets will never love you back. Hey guys. Well, today we're going to have a great show. I appreciate everyone coming into the chat. So far we got 58 people. I got a special guest tonight. I'm sure you all know. His name is Larry Romano. He's a character actor. I tell you, he's really good at what he does. He's in a whole bunch of films. You know, he's in a Laugh, Kill a Laugh. He's in a lockup. He plays a Sylvester Stallone sidekick, uh, first base. He was in Bullet with Mickey Rock, Frankie Eyelashes. But he played so many roles, this guy. I tell you, you know what? I didn't even know how many roles this guy played until I, I checked him out on IMDb. But uh, he's really good. I've been speaking with him for a long time. And you know what? I haven't Googled his name since the other day. <laughs> and I realized how many films this guy been in. And he has a lot of credits underneath his name. But I'm glad to see everyone in the chat today. Now we got 102 people in here. I want to give a shout out to my guy, Boston J, Live and Let Live. I see a lot of people in the chat. Graffiti Mouth, I see you. Dean OG, Miss Can't Be Wrong, thanks for coming. Princess Mish, Sly Stallone. I think we got Sly Stallone in here. <laughs> Ryan Brown, what's up, Ryan Brown? And all the people who came, Dawn Marie, Carmine S., Brad R., thank you all for showing up. I truly appreciate it for coming and support me and Larry Romano. I mean, Larry Romano, this guy really is an awesome guy, okay? What I'm going to do is I have a six-minute clip I'm going to put up where you can see all the films he's been in. Now, he's been in more films than, uh, you know, what's in this clip. And we also have... Uh, a nice surprise for you. It's called uh, Sally in the Park, something that uh, Larry Romano is uh, producing, directing, and Chuck Zito is in it. Never seen before this film. So we're going to play a little clip for that too. I feel like, you know what? I haven't seen you guys in a long time. 134 people in the chat. Keep on rolling, baby. Let's make it up to 800 today. So Don Vito, What's up? Ryan Brown, Boston J, my guy. Okay, let me play this clip for you guys, okay? This is uh, Larry Romano with a lot of scenes. I tell you, you know, this guy is really good. You know, honestly, I got to know this guy, and also I got to love this guy. I talk to him often, and I've been speaking with him for a long time, and I didn't realize how many films he's been in. You know, he's in Bullet with Mickey Rock. I mean, you got to watch this guy. This guy really is good. So let's uh, put up the six-minute clip, check it out, and then I'll be back with Larry Romano, okay? Okay, guys. I'll blow your motherfucking head you off. You look at this bullshit, will you? So what do we do now, Matty, huh? Now, come on, Matty Horse. Me and you, we fucking break each other's balls. I'll blow your motherfucking Maddie, head off. Matty, I got to deliver this kid to Mr. Joseph in a couple hours. If that don't fucking happen, it's on my ass. Well, this kid has got to fucking apologize to me, or this gun don't fucking move. Now, you let me take care of this, and you'll get the fucking apology you want, I promise you. Now, put the fucking gun away. Put the fucking gun away. We want you to start picking up a second paycheck again, like when you worked for Angelo Marino. Yeah, you said that on the phone. I don't know where you get that. So you met me here because you wanted a breath of fresh air. I met you here because I wanted to know what the hell you were talking about. What I'm talking about is my employer is in possession of private records that Angelo Marino kept. You're on his list, Janice. Friendly cops. So stop acting like you still got your cherry. I never took a cent from Angelo Marino. 
I was trying to protect my father. You're a good daughter, good for you. And Marino's dead now. And my father's dead too. Life goes on though, Janice. You got your own career to think about. I think you want to cooperate here. You don't want any bad publicity emerging. This journal entry, that's Marino's own handwriting. Janice, I'm over here. Who do you work for? It's nothing for you to think about. All you gotta do is every so often we'll have a request. You get us what we need and everything's hunky dunk. Yeah, what kind of requests? Easy stuff. Look at this. We want you to work up this guy's license plate. We need his home and business address. Plus the 500 that's in it, it's bad for your character to turn that down. Not to mention I'll say you took it anyways and go buy lottery tickets. Come on, Janice, we're talking about running a license plate Screw here. you, man. I know what we are talking about. Come on, cheer up. Have this stuff for me this time tomorrow. Yeah, well, I'll let you know when I decide. Tomorrow, I'll save us two parking spaces. Talk to you guys. I told you, go screw yourselves. Richie, I'm Inspector Anthony Lestarza, head of the Organized Crime Task Force. How do you do? Let's screw you, too. Hey, Hands you think you're going to make some kind of miraculous recovery, Richie? Huh? You're not. Who shot you? Who shot Tommy Lenardi? I'll tell you what, man. Go ask Jerry Franco. Is that who shot you? That's Jerry. He's at his girlfriend. It's 1 King Street, number 216, Gina Zeroni. Did Jerry shoot Tommy Lenardi? Moves about those things. Listen, listen. When you get with Jerry, you tell him I banged his girlfriend. You tell Jerry Gina had me up Christmas Eve, and I banged her. Her mouth was open so wide, screaming. I saw her tonsils. You tell him that. You hear me? Get away. He's in arrest. I. What are you doing this? You got a fucking sock on your head, fool. But you know, I like you, but like with my guys, you gotta do things right. I ain't saying you go out and get a three-piece suit. You can take a fucking bed for crying out loud. You're walking around like you're still inside. You gotta lie on a ball. You're underestimating yourself. You gotta dress seriously. You want people to respect you. What do you think, I'm blind? You keep banging that shit in your arm. Ain't nobody gonna take you serious. How you doing? So, oh, you here for my dad? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm dying. Hey, Tom, how are you? Good. Merry Christmas. Hey, thanks. Come on in. Ben is watching TV. You met Tommy? Yes, we met. Thank you. Separated from the pop. We're going out for a couple hours, okay? Merry Christmas. Don, take care. Yeah, you too. Larry Romano. Here he is, guys. I'll tell you, you know what? I got to know this guy. I love this guy. I really do. I fucking love this guy. This guy is great. A great actor. I didn't even know how great this guy was. But anyway, 180 people in the chat. Let's check out Larry Romano. Hey. What's up, baby? Hey. How's everything? Hey. hey, Jimmy. I love your show, man. You know, I'm in there all the time listening to the show. And uh, it's great to be on finally and talk to you about this and and I love what you're doing beyond, you know, you know, you're giving a great message out there and, you know, and we talk entertainment and you're creative, your brother's creative and hey man, rock and roll, bro. I'll tell you, Larry, you know why? <laughs> it's funny because when you first contacted me, you know, honestly, I didn't yeah. even know who you were. Yeah. You know, I didn't know who you were. And then we started talking here and there. And I, then I Googled your name recently. I said, wow. I said, I didn't realize this guy was in Bullet. This guy was in Laugh, Killer, Laugh. He was in Lockup. He was in Donnie Brasco. I mean, I think you had a part in Sleepers, right? Man number two. Yeah, Sleepers, man number two. That was a story, man. That was a good one. I mean, I mean yeah, yeah. listen, you know what? Look, NYPD Blue, King yeah. of Queens. I mean, listen, seriously, I, listen, you are a great actor. Can I mean? Thank you. Well, Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been uh, doing it. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit of how I got into it. And, um, you know, we, we got in contact eventually too. Melissa Clark, who has making a difference 
is doing an article on you, I think. And yes. she's been integral too in, uh, in connecting us. And she's been good connecting me with other people. And she's doing the making a difference stuff, which is a beautiful thing because we talked about that too. We you know we're at a crossroads as a people and, uh, and the positiveness that we have to spread throughout our communities. Um, yeah, the acting is, you know, it was a great thing, Jimmy. Um, I found myself in a situation where, um, you know, my father was in a garment business and the garment business was going overseas and it was really wasn't going anywhere. Uh, I was a drummer, you know, that was one of my talents. I'm, you know, I wasn't a John Bonham and Neil Perp, but I was in a couple bands, you know, a high school. I was in a band called, um, Man, called Blizzard and Danny Spitz, who went on to form Anthrax, was the guitar player. Amendola, Langson, we had a band. But now in the 80s, you know, the music changed and there's drum machines. You know, and I had a drum machine. I felt like the, um, I was like the Iceman, you know, when the, when the residential refrigerator came around. I was like, oh, wow. You know, this drum machine could keep a beat, keep a time, shows up on time, never has an excuse, you know. And, um, and I was lost, you know, I was lost, man. And I, I you know, I took some, I, this bartending and, um, and um, I was walking down 7th Avenue or Broadway one, one day and I saw a, a box with the news, with a magazine called The Learning Annex in there. And I opened it up and I said, what could I do? I had to learn something. You know, I got out of high school. I mean, they basically pushed this out. You know, I couldn't really spell. I found out when I started writing screenplays, I couldn't spell. Um, and that's where I took a few classes and there was a, a Weist Baron commercial acting class. And um, I took it and, you know, it was a whole bunch of people in there. And I really felt out of place because I could tell they were more college educated people, you know, and they had more of that 1980s kind of shine to them where I was more of, you know, they used to call us the bridge and tunnel people. You remember? Yes. Used to wait, maybe, I don't know if you had the Capizios and all of that shit, you know? And uh, I was just getting hot, just knowing that I had to get up there and read, you know, when smoke starts coming out, yeah, you're like, boom. But when I got up and read, I says, you know what, you're just going to blast it out there. And I did. And the teacher said, you have something. And I never forget that, man, because that was that spark. It was that thing. And that's the thing that we need to, you know, we need, kids need that, that spark. You have something, whether it's baking bread or whatever it may be, you know, Jimmy, a plumber. Whatever it might be, you figure out plumbing, you figure out electric. These are essentials to our life. So that woman, that teacher, at Weiss Barron, she set me on my way from there. It, it went along. I ended up going to uh, Lee Strasberg, where your brother studied. Yes. Right? And um, I wanted to study with Al Pacino's coach. I wanted to ride the two, two train through the Bronx. And then I would switch to 180, get the five, and come down to Union Square. Because I figured that's what Pacino rode. You know what I mean? Pacino rode this train. Maybe it was the 60s, whatever he was right. But he rode that train. And, um, <clears throat> and you know, that, that builds character, you know, riding the, the five and the two and the five through the South Bronx and you go through it. And, and, it, and it's, um, and when I got down to Strasbourg, I discovered playwriting. There was a playwriting class there. And, uh, and, and I saw Bridget, what's her name, Bridget Fonda and Billy Otis do a two-actor play. And it was a, one of those nights in New York was rainy, damp, you know, and you just went into the theater and it was a very cozy atmosphere. And I really would be awesome if I had more productions like this in New York because I walked in, I didn't pay nothing, you know, it was free, it was uh, you know, whatever it was. And I said, wow, you know, if I could write a story, because I was already writing, you know, and I was like, well, I write a story, but a play on a stage, I could just do this. I don't need a million dollars. I don't need cameras. I don't need nothing. So I started writing about things I knew and so on and so forth. And um, the one of the things I knew was that I was a drummer and I played with guys who play guitar and play bass and, uh, you know, a couple nights in the park, reminiscing, drinking, whatever. And it evolved and it became uh, Danny and Mikey, drummer and guitar player, crossroads of their lives, 1986. I was at the crossroads of mine. A lot of people were, you know. Um, and, uh, and it evolved and they put it up as a work in progress with Anna Strasberg at the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute on 15th street. And it went over well, you know, it went over well, man. And, um, there was people that helped me along, you know, there was a fellow by the name of Carmine Rizzo, my calm printing on 27th street. I used to pass his place from the subway because I was working in that vicinity, selling copy machine supplies at that time. 
and, and like just make it a few dollars before going to, you know what I mean? Like this, you know? And I stopped by and called mine. We took a liking and he did the, the flyer on high, nice print and he came down and I never forget, you know, I was backstage getting ready to go on stage and I was so nervous because you could hear the voices in the, in the, in the audience. And it's, uh, and, and I never been on stage before. And the actors I was with, they were Greg Hecht, who was uh, Charlie Lawton's driver. He used to drive up to Al Pacino's house every weekend with Charlie. And, you know, we, we spoke acting thoroughly, you know, we got into it deep, man. You know, uh, uh, it was Carlos Linares in there. Ray, Ray Perez was in there. He played flex, uh, Melanie Bichante. It was all, you know, the whole cast. I wish I had the flyer here, but, <clears throat> and I never forget, Jimmy, I'm looking out the window at a parking lot because we're on 15th street. I'm looking out the window in a parking lot and I'm looking at the tire of a BMW and I'm looking at it and I'm so nervous. I'm thinking, I wish I was a tire. I wish I didn't have to do this. You know what I mean? I want to be a tire. And, um, and just, and then the guy comes in, he goes, Hey Larry, there's a guy out there. Calm on. I keep telling him it's free, but he keeps wanting to give me a hundred dollars. <laughs> Call mine, wherever you are, man. You know, I got to tell you, you know, uh, there's a whole other story there, but, um, so we went, did the play, it went up and, uh, it was my first, you know, rodeo. And I really had a meltdown, like not meltdown, but gather myself after that. You know, I remember I had to do what really started to relax me back then. As I look back on it, is I had to start doing gardening. You know what I mean? I had to get in touch with the garden. It was like after all that pressure of being on stage, the first thing, and then where do you go from here? So I was gardening and um, ended up driving, you know, a gypsy cab for a while. That was, a, that was a story. And that's where I first found out about the book called Wise Guy. It was, we used to get dispatched at a Riverside, uh, Riverside Towers off the FDR, 23rd Street, and 30, 34th Street between there. And we get dispatched. It used to be like DC Cab, like that movie. Everybody had, one guy had a two-door AMC Pacer and he was driving like Gypsy Cab. It was like Uber before Uber. So um, we ended up going and doing a play again in New York, in Manhattan. It went off, off Broadway, Saturday in the park. And that's where Joy Todd saw us and she cast me opposite Sylvester Stallone. And that was my boom, man. You know. Now, uh, now, now Saturday in the park, you've yeah. been uh you've been trying to get this film out there for how long now? Well, so you know, obviously when we did it now, we we did it uh, in New York City in 1987 at the William Redfield. It was 87, 88, the William Redfield Theater. And um and then, then I got those parts with Sylvester Stallone, and then we did it again in Los Angeles, and that's where it came about that, well, what happened in Los Angeles is that I got invited to play softball on a team. They needed guys in Malibu, and I went out there, and I was um, I was out there, and um, uh, Boom Boom Mancini was one of the outfielders, Danny Aiello, Ricky Aiello. I love, uh, Boom, Danny Aiello, I love Boom Boom Mancini, I love. Well, Danny Aiello the third, Danny's son. Okay. You know, yeah. But that movie that you saw with Vinny Pastor, that was Danny Aiello the third directing, and um, and Danny plays uh, you know, he's in the movie. Um, but I, that's where we met. Uh, you know, the shortstop was he went on to write Meet the Parents, and the pitcher he says, you know, I heard you wrote a really cool play. Could I read it? I says, yeah, sure. So he says, I got a theater down here called The Burbage. And, you know, and I read the play. He says, I'm, let's put it up. So when I'm in Hollywood now putting up the play, Chaz had just sold the Bronx Tale. And next thing you know, people were around. I had an agent. His name was Daryl Marshak. And Daryl was a very creative agent. He was good, man. He was good. You know, <clears throat> a lot of agents, they just want to get their client on a TV show because they collect that money steady, which is good. Don't get me wrong. But Daryl had a creativity to him. You know, he's creative. And, you know, he says to me, he goes, just shoot the play. I says, what do you mean shoot the play? He's two guys in the park. He goes, it's great. Go watch a movie called My Dinner with Andre, which is a movie. If you're going to watch My Dinner with Andre, you have to watch it. You can't have your cell phone on. You have to watch on every word. And you'll see a lot of things in My Dinner with Andre that they're talking about are happening right now to our world. And, um, and I watched it. And it was tough for me to watch at that time. And I was still young. And I, but I, you know, I says, okay, wow, well, okay, keep it interesting. And then I got into Jim Jarmish. Daryl says, go watch Jim Jarmish movies, Stranger in Paradise, 
there was another movie with Roberto Benino. Um, my mind sometimes, you know, I got to think, you know, I got so, so much stuff going on. But I got into Jarmish, you know, and there's a whole story about how Jarmish's guys came about that goes back to like eight millimeter cameras that were taken off a truck, probably by some, somebody, you know what I mean? And next thing you know, there was a whole village was flooded with eight millimeter cameras and you couldn't get any eight millimeter film anywhere in the village because all these guys were going out shooting because somebody must have hijacked the truck with a whole bunch of other thing. And there was a shop over there. So I got into Jamish and, but what happened now is Hollywood wants you to rewrite. You got to open it up. It can't be two guys on the street. It's got to be this. It's got to be that. It's got to be all of this stuff. So you write and you rewrite and you keep going, rewrite. And then you bring it, you read it again. Then you go, what I, what I do is, you know, read the script with actors. You sit at the table, you read the script and you get a feel for it, the rhythm. And then you rewrite. Um, and I got to tell you, I did so many rewrites on his Jimmy. And really what it did is just blow up the budget going to blow up the budget and it got shelved man you know it got shelved and um fast forward uh i did a reading in hollywood it was uh, joey russo and uh and jeremy luke and a couple other actors we did some readings and it was like wow this is you know just the way it is we eventually went up to rob weiss's house who did a uh, entourage um went up there we did a reading up there and Rob was like, this is great, you know, but, you know, you got to do this, got to do that, got to do this, got to do that. And, you know, some of the things you know about what, how I tackled life after the King of Queens, some of the things I told you. But at that particular time, when we was going, when I was having these rewrites with with uh, Jeremy and Joey and my dog was dying, I was still working this, you know, you know a, lot of, a lot of weight on you. I had a lot of shit going on, in other words, you know. So I shelved it again, you know, and I guess fast forward to 2014, a few few gentlemen, uh, people, they got behind it with some finances. And in 2015, we shot it against all odds. And it would be really cool if some of the actors, in addition to Chuck Zito, could come on eventually and talk to you about it. I'm sure they would be really, um, you know, interested in doing that and talking about the experience. We shot that film. It's a period piece over about 15 days all entirely in the Bronx and that's wardrobe and it's, you know, production design. And, um, a <clears throat> friend of mine from high school, Maria Matakis, she's, um, she has New York jungle. She's got a hair salon. She volunteered. She did all the hair, you know, and, um, and uh, they really were troopers. You know, the crew was troopers. A lot of women, strong women on the, on the, on the crew. And it was a period piece in New York city. And we shot it against all odds. Um, and uh, the wardrobe, you know, when you look at the wardrobe, nailing the wardrobe for that era at that budget, she did a fantastic job. The hair, you know, you look at some of the characters and, um, you know, some people, you know, like I was talking to Pete Antico, Pete Antico has been a friend of mine forever. He's doubled De Niro. He's done, you look up Pete Antico, he's a award winning stunt man. And, uh, and I wrote this scene and I tailored it for him to play the bouncer, you know, cause I knew him. You know an actor, you know a person, it's easy to write for them. And he said to me the other day that he says, you made a great movie. I says, but Pete, no, we made a great movie. And I says, if it wasn't for you on that set with that nine page scene with your experience, I wouldn't have been able to come off that good. I'm sorry, bro. This is a team effort. And in addition to that, those actors to give me that performance time and time again, and kind of mimic it. Like we were auditioning characters for Pete's role, you know, cause I had to bring other guys in. <clears throat> and this one guy, you know, I'd film him and I liked, I liked being live with the actor because you could, uh, you know, the zoom stuff that actors got to go through nowadays is ah, I can't do it, bro. You know, it's just not cool. And I don't ever want to have to do it, but that's another story. So when I got the actors auditioning, you know, I could direct them there in the room and the camera. And then I go back and I watch it and over and over again. And I watched this one character. Oh, wow, this guy's really interesting. This guy is interesting. But then I watched take after take in the audition. And every time he did it differently. And then I talked to somebody about him. He says, yeah, that's what you're going to get with him. Every time he does it, he's going to do something different. I says, if I got him in a nine page scene and every time he's doing something different, I'm going to have problems down the road. So having Pete in that scene with all his experience 
having uh, Amanda and um, and Emma, Amanda Nichols, Emma Cantor, you know, uh, and then of course Ilya Constantine plays Danny, Aaron Sorter, oh my God, he's so terrific. Uh, he plays Mikey, and then Sammy Guzman plays Flex, which the wardrobe on Flex for that era is so perfect. When you see the scenes, you see, I guess you can put the trailer up eventually. Um, so now after that was initially shot. I had an issue, a legal issue that took place in a, I learned a lot about the system cause, and you know, it was, it was stressful. There was things going on and maybe at another time we'll talk about that, but I was stuck in New York. I wasn't allowed to leave New York and I was in New York. I had to finish the film and then I was stuck in New York and uh, my kid's mother passed away of cancer. So now I went home to a nest of hornets, you know, and, you know, you want to hear this, that, and the other thing. And it was very difficult from that time on. And then I got the cancer. And then there was a lot of hiccups in between of what was going on with the particular project. And I didn't want to just blast it out there. It's a piece of art, you know? So I had to suck it up. I had to go, I had to take a knee, Jimmy. You know, it's like a boxer. You got to take a knee every now and then, you know? You know, years ago, I remember... Larry, you know what? Larry, I yeah. don't want to interrupt you. And listen, yeah. listen, you're doing great. And the thing is, that's why I love you. See, you just said sometimes you got to take a knee. You know yeah. what? I spoke with you before, and I know you've been fighting the battles of life. And you know what? And you give me a lot of wise words. And uh, listen, you have a lot of people in this chat. We got 238 people in the chat. And you got a lot of fans over here. Okay? Uh, a lot of people are asking... You know, what happened to Richie and uh, King of Queens? So I get to tell the, everybody right now, because I really never told it live, actually, what had happened or how it all went down. But it actually, in some ways, it does come back to music. I'm going to take a sip, too, man. I'm a little dried out. Yeah, I, I recycle my, like, if I got a wine bottle, this, I get this at Trader Joe's, organic wine. If I drink wine, it's organic. And I recycle it because I don't like to throw out. I'm all about the earth. You know what I mean? That's it. Enjoy. And I know you love animals, too. Animals. I mean, I'm look, I'm not about electric cars. Don't get me wrong. But I'm about, you know, zero waste. You know what I mean? There's zero waste dot com. Like there's this woman I just got turned on to her. The little things we could do to save the earth. But um, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, what we was talking about, sometimes I lose my train there. What we going in? A, a lot of people are asking. About oh, all right. what, happened, what happened Back to Richie? You, you, listen, yeah. you played Richie yeah. for two years. What happened to Richie? Okay, so previously to Richie, I was just coming off the movie The Thin Red Line, which was a fantastic experience. I was in Australia for six months. And um came down and I got in there and um and uh, I auditioned for Kevin James, Michael Whitehorn, David Litt. Michael Whitehorn and David Litt were the creators of The King and Queens. At that time, Michael had just come off a show called Ned and Stacy, And David was a writer on Ned and Stacy too. And I loved that show. And that was a time in my life when I didn't have time to watch TV, but I used to watch Ned and Stacy. I loved it, man. You know? And then I got to meet Michael and and the, the, the audition went off. Boom. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's Richie, you know? And um, <clears throat> they ended up making an offer. It's straight up. Oh, well, my agent at the time was Harry Gold, Gold Marshak. Leo was with them as well. And, uh, and Harry's, I says, Harry, do I really have to test? Because the test deal is when you go in front of the network and, you know, there's maybe you, two or three actors, and you have to stand there and read. It's, it's stressful, you know? There was a time, it was like down the road, we tell you a story. My cousin, Carmine Givinazzo, who played uh, Danny Messer on CSI New York for 10 seasons, and uh, him and I went up for the same role on a Tracy Morgan show with Lenny Venuti, and Lenny Venuti got the part. But, like, here's the two cousins. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going. So I'm like, bro, I don't want to test. I don't want to go through that. So Harry's like, okay, I got Leah. I'm going to try and wrangle this in here. Boom. So you ain't got to test. We get a straight offer. Bang, straight offer. So I got the offer, and uh, I went back home to New York. And I that's when I did the movie with Danny Pastor. And, um, you know, when everything jumps off at that time, um, 
I always been doing music and it's always been that passion, that music that draws you back. There's a guy in New York in the Bronx, Tony DeLulo. We've written out, you know, albums. He had a studio with the drums. I go down there, we track the drums, he throws a guitar, and that music's gonna come out. You know, I don't know if you read that report the the Hollywood reporter about the band that we had in Los Angeles. And the Hollywood Reporter is a really good publication. They call us the heavy metal kings of the new millennium. And as fate would be it. You know, that's a whole other story, how that band dissolved. And, um, but at the time with the King of Queens, I was, you know, passionate about the music, man. I was like, oh man, I just, this gives me a window because now I got financing. I could go in a studio and I could pay musicians because, you know, musicians got bills to pay and the music industry ain't like it used to be where they're rolling in it. And now I got a few bucks. I could spread the love, right? And that's what I'm going to do. So now I'm just playing music go out there, start filming the first season of the King of Queens. And you know, everything was cool at that time. Right. I think we would do three on and then one off. So we go three weeks and then one off. And I think after the first, the first week off, I went back to New York and we wrote that King of Queens song, Tony DeLulo, Peter Francavilla. It's a really cool song. We got the video and, um, you know, went back out to LA and finish the first season. And, you know, the first season, everything's great, you know? Oh, yeah, you know, oh, wow, you know, what I mean? oh, yeah, you know, uh, so on. And I'm sitting there going, okay, well, I got a pile of cash, man. And, you know, I got all these lyrics and I got all this music. And uh, the kid that was living downstairs in the, in the apartment in Sherman Oaks, Kenny Grossman, I used to hear him playing music. So I went down there one day. I said, bro, hey, you playing music. You track it down here. He's like, yeah, is it too loud? I'll lower it. I says, lower it. I want to come in and hear it. He said, yeah. I'm like, yeah. He goes, oh, because the last people up there, they complain. I said, I ain't complaining. I want to hear it. So I go in there. Next thing you know, Kenny turns me on to uh, Steve Werbelo, who may rest in peace. He was, man, I miss that dude. Um, and he had Sound Asylum. And then we had Ty Dennis on the drums. Ty is playing with uh, Robbie Krieger now. And we took all these tracks, man, and I was in ecstasy because I'm just playing music and I go do a couple of shows, collect money, make some more music and so on and so on. And then kind of within that second season, things started to be a different vibe, you know, and um, and I, you know, I, you know, had a little bit of a different vibe as well. You know, I kind of, you know, you get bored. It's like. You know, I express this. It's like us Italians. We got to play the dumb Dago. We got to play the mafia guy. We never played the guy that invented the radio. And Richie's a um, a caricature of Joey Tribbiani. And it's you know the writers could do better, but the network and all that other stuff they're gonna they're gonna you know, this is where we got to channel it. Oh yeah, you know he's got to do more of this. You know what I mean? He's got to you know. And okay, all right, you know. But I'm a creative person, man. You know, and um. And that gets a little like, uh, and then it was kind of like, you know, uh, I guess it's just not a good, great vibe. And it's notorious that the set was not a great vibe. You know, David Litt let, left after the second season. You know, people left. And um, Michael Whitehorn, who is, you know, he's one of the coolest guys and most honest guys I've ever been in a business with, you know, and he deserves all the success that he has. And he's a smart guy. He's witty plays the drums. He's from New York. He was the guy who was really driving that train. And he called me up one day. He says, Larry, I know that you've been talking to some of the writers that about your role. And, you know, I have some things coming up in after the holidays that you're going to have some really good roles, which was this, the episode where uh, Doug and Carrie met, you know? And I said, Michael, <clears throat> I, I my contract at the end of the season, for the third season goes all shows produced. And that's where I'm a little concerned. I saw what happened to Lisa Rafael, who played the sister. There one day, gone the next. And I had been working my tail off and making promises to my kids that I was going to bring them to Los Angeles eventually and have a, um, and they would have their own room and they would have a dog and a yard and so on. And, um, and that was, I was gearing for that. So when Michael tells me that, you know, I, when Michael was honest with me, that's where it gets honest. You know, he says, listen, Larry, we don't really see Richie walking in the door 25 times a year saying hello. And, you know, I says, well, how many times am I walking in the door? 
He says, maybe 10. So I'm thinking 10 episodes. Okay. You're looking at 10 at 17,000, which I was making at that time is 170,000. But after agents, after managers, after taxes, after the whole nine, I ain't bringing no kids out to Los Angeles. They're going to LA Unified. You know what I mean? So um, then he says, it's probably a pay cut too. It's a pay cut too. I said, what do I do? You know what I mean? What do I do over here? I was a soldier for you. I come off the Thin Red Line with Sean Penn. The movie, everybody wanted to be in the Thin Red Line. I'm coming off that movie. And I'm not the guy that walks in the door and says hello 25 times. Give me some beef, you know? Give me some work for it. So I says, Mike, just let me out. He says, why? I said, you let me out, man. I mean, you're going to wrap me up from August all the way through March that I can't do anything else anyway. You're going to diminish my role. It's not a fun place to be, man. You know it's not, you know? And um, let me out. And he worked to let me out, you know? Obviously, Kevin's brother was coming on doing episodes at that time. It was eking slowly, and that's part of the thing. And nothing against the kid. He's got to get a job too, you know? So, um, you know, nepotism, you know, that don't work in baseball, though. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, what I mean? you know, it works in Hollywood. It don't work in baseball. And um, and it don't work in the mob, neither, because you just told the story about a guy whose father was somebody, but he wasn't somebody. I think the story you told about uh, uh, somebody was dating this guy's daughter who was on drugs and and Spiro told you to go give the guy, guy you're beating. You and Paulie went that story. Remember? Yes, yes. You said it. Right. So the nepotism, that guy didn't belong being a captain, right or wrong. Like, you know what I mean? So now, so there's nepotism in Hollywood, but you are not going to get that in professional sports because it's going to show, right? So, so when I started going on auditions, CBS right away, what's going on? Why is he going? We're on a hit show. Why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? I said, listen, man, I'm listen. But also too, once they heard I was out, Susan Vash, who cast me and mad about you, she, she, um, Gary Montalione sounds very familiar. I don't know if he lived in, uh, in Rockland County or not, but there was a Montalione. He's, uh, yeah. He, he's, uh, actually a guy that's in, uh, Michael Francesi's inner circle, but also, uh, Stephen Sly sends his love. Oh, Stevie Sly. Yeah, man. Stevie Sly, that was, Stevie Sly, Stevie Sly, Sly man. Oh, man. And Cackle. I was just thinking of Cackle today, Stevie Sly. I hope you guys are doing great. I saw a photo of me wearing the hat that Cackle bought me when we worked together on a show that Stevie Sly was hosting called The People That I Like Show. And I he they guys, those guys are cool. They financed the whole band to come. Well, I came and Tony DeLulo played bass. Uh, Frank pick around, pick. Frankie, Frankie pick around. I don't want to say his name wrong. It was 20 years ago. Eric Moriello on bass. And we played live in front of the studio audience for Steve Stannett. Yeah, that was great, man. See, it comes back to the music, you know? And um, so back to Kristen, which music, talk about music. So Susan Vesh had cast me and mad about you. And she heard I was out, out there. She pulled me in. And she got me read with Kristen Chenoweth. And I was like, Wow. You know, Kristen Chenoweth, she wanted, she was coming off of Tony on Broadway, which, right, that's a pedigree, man. I'm like, what? You know? And then she's a world-class opera singer. Top of that, she's cool. She's cool. And she's going, we're going to do this. Next thing you know, I'm in it, bro. And now I'm bringing memories up because because Anthony LaPaglia, who I told you the story about 29th Street, yes. he tested. He tested for the role that John Tenney got to play opposite me, and NBC didn't want him. We went to Anthony LaPaglia house one night, one day on a Sunday so we could work with him. It was Kristen Chenoweth, John Marcus, one of the writers, Nicole, Nicole from West Texas, who was John's assistant, myself. And we worked with Anthony. We went into NBC the next day. We walked out. No go. Next. We went to Eastside Morales, the whole bit. But anyhow, so now what happens is, is that I'm like, I'm out. I'm like, yo, I, I could go over here. It's guaranteed on the air, 22 on the air. So the only thing I screwed up on now is my contract, which was not was my fault. I should have known better. So now what happens is, is that I'm like, yo, I want to get out. Why do I want to go there? I can go to the Paramount lot with Christian Chenoweth. Hello? You know what I mean? Like, this is like, okay. So Michael Whitehorn fought, and he got me out of the contract. And for that, 
I had a, I want to send you a picture eventually. I went to an event with Ann Ligori, who was like the WFAN sports lady back in the day. I went to an event. Yogi Bear and Whitey Ford were there. I had a Yankee jacket. Wow. They signed it in red, right? And I had pictures. So I was so grateful to Michael Whitehorn that I had that mounted in a glass enclosure with the pictures of Whitey and Yogi. And I gave it to him. I said, thank you for getting me out of this. And let me go on to Christian Chenoweth. And from there, it was like, it, first of all, it was a big pay increase. And where I screwed up on that was that, and that was, that was partly my fault, but I should have been looked out for better. And for all the other actors out there, you know, you have to have agents. You have to, I, I, so I totally suggest lawyers, you know, sometimes even two, you know, want to look over the next one, the contracts. But, um, I, you know, I should have got like an out that if it didn't get picked up, I would have got a lump sum, you know, or something, but I didn't. I was just so happy that I had more money and I could go make more music. And that's when the band, we started rocking, bro. We did, first of all, when the summer 99, we did one 24 track recording in Redondo Beach with a producer on, on two inch 24 track, like real Led Zeppelin type of thing where we went in there and just did it. And um, then we, we wrote another album together and we did the same thing. And then we started playing the, the strip. And that's when the Hollywood Reporter says that we were like the bada bings of the new, new millennium, the rock and roll kings. And we were like, yeah. And we had, you know, and they wanted me back to do the King of Queens. I did that show with Eric Roberts. I did the paintball episode. But we were rolling with Kristen. But what happened with Kristen, bro, this is where it gets technical. Paramount, okay, NBC had... NBC had friends, they had Seinfeld, and it Larry, was- Larry, yeah. Larry, one minute, one minute, and I, and I hate to interrupt you. Go ahead, bro, it's your show, man. Hey, no, nah, it's your show, too. Karina uh, Michio, Jimmy, say, yeah. say hi to Larry for me, please. The Katharina Michio story, she plays the mom in Saturday in the Park, and um, uh, in Saturday in the Park, I wanted the mom to have a talent, a skill, as an artist that had transcended down to the sun. So I went to a charity event and I met Katharina. And then after the charity event, we went over to the cutting room in New York City and her artwork was on display. And I looked at her artwork and she's done like, you know, Billy Joel, um, Ron Wood from the Rolling Stones, Bocelli. I'm like, wow, look at this. And it's, and it's really like good stuff. You know, I'm like, wow, look at this. So we started talking. I said, you know what? Have you ever acted before? She said, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, well, I want you to come in and read. I want you to read for the mother. You know, and she came in and I says, if I, I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm going to see if I could put like a nice art room in the movie for her and use her artwork in the movie, you know, and um, she came in and she read, man, you know, I got to tell you, and I, you know, I gave a little direction, of course. And I says, it's it. I gave her a job on the spot. I says, you're right. You're done. It's it. Yeah, no, you're done. That's it. You're on to it. And we're going to see what kind of paintings you got because we're going to figure out how to decorate these walls. And you see the character, Danny, when he comes home in the opening sequence, when he goes up the stairs, her painting of her uncle is there. And I think it's her, aunt, her uncle with the grapes, her aunt, make, aunt making us macaronis. And then you come up, I think it's Louis Armstrong over there. You know, her artwork is in there. And um, and then I says, Kat, I want you to do this scene where it's Saturday night and you're painting. And I want you to create this painting of your son's journey where he's going down this barren street uh, path. He doesn't know what's going to happen, you know, and his and she did, and you'll see it's in the movie. So yeah, so that's the Katharina Michio story. And go to her website because she's got really, I gotta tell you, man, she's got some real cat uh, michioart.com. You know, you guys should check that out. She's really good. Hey, talking about artists, check this out. You guys got graffiti mouth, right? I heard graffiti mouth, right? Graffiti mouth. That's so, uh yeah, that yeah, you spoke with him. Yeah. So th that's a, this is this is in the movie Saturday in the Park. BL did this. I don't know if you know BL. We met, I, I did some drum tracks for him because I was 86 in the movie with the Mets, even though they're in the Bronx. And look at this guy, LT. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? So, trailer, baby. Yeah. And they came in, these guys, they cut to 164th Street and they came in and they did a job, man. They tagged that place up because I needed authenticity. A lot of art involved in the movie. Lady Fever, a lot of art, you know? And um, so um, back to the Christian. Yeah. Katrina. She says, thank you so much. What a great experience. Yeah. You know, everybody was crying when she did her scene. It was very touching. 
Very touching. You know, he's very touching. Yeah, she did a great job. Casting yeah. is big, man. Casting is big, bro. You got to yeah, Larry, Larry, should we uh put that Chuck Zito? Yeah. Flip in there. Hey, maybe you want to start with Katarina and then go to Chuck since Katarina's on. Do you have Katarina scene? I don't, I'm not sure if I have oh, one. I'm not I sure. Will, one. I will get it at a later time. Yeah, sure. Whatever you want to do, that'd be cool. You know, that's a whole other story how we came about with Chuck. Let's, uh, let's watch Chuck Zito, okay? I'm going to go uh, take a walk over there and get some fresh air, right? Yeah, Saturday yeah. in the park. I'm going to go ahead. off camera. Sure, right. Go ahead. Saturday right. in the park, guys. All right, Chuck Zito. Let's check out Chuck Zito. 246 people in the chat. Thanks, guys, for showing up. You were out drinking last night? Well, how many times do I have to tell you? If you're going to stay out all night, at least call me. Let me know you're all right. I was with some broad. What am I supposed to do? Be like, time out, I got to call my daddy? Some broad? What do you mean, some broad? Is that the way you talk about women? Huh? You want somebody to talk about your sister that way? No. Huh? You want somebody to talk about your mother that way? No. Hey, show a little respect. Don't talk about other people's sisters or mothers that way. You better watch that tool, okay? There's a lot of AIDS out there. Yeah, I know. No, you think you know. You and your friend Mikey playing that devil music all the time? You're not kids no more. It's not devil music. It's not devil music? <laughs> the name of the band is the Devil Maniacs. It's devil music. It's not devil music. Ah, forget about it. I know your mother goes along with the program. She makes all your little jacks. She makes everything for you. I go along with her artwork, but the music and your hair. I don't want to talk about my hair. I know, because your mother loves it. In fact, she loves everything you do. But you better make her proud. And don't do no drugs. Yeah, I know. Just say no. Crack is whack. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exact the mundo. Now, come on. I know you're working on your jab. Let me see the jab. Come on. Let me see the jab. Jab. Double jab, right hand hook. That's it. Okay, come down. Again, right hand. Hook. Good. That's my boy. Hey, you ever hear that story about the young wise man? No. Because there's no such thing as a young wise man. So remember that. That's a great clip. And you know what? It's so true. There's no such thing as a young, wise man. Yep, exactly. And you know what? I said that to a, a young actor who thought he was on his way to instamatic superstardom. And he disagreed with me, but he got his taste at the end. It's ironic how that worked out. You know, <clears throat> the thing, you know, when you work with actors, and I'm talking about actors, not movie stars, not celebrities, um, but people that just really want to bring it, you know, and Katanina wanted to bring it. She's an artist. And Chucky Zito, you know, he comes and he brings it, you know. I don't got to give him a big trailer, you know. Actuality, he drove some actors home after the night was done. But he's there. He's ready. He wants to take direction. And um, there's... You know, how that all came about with Chuck as well, because I wanted the father to be a strong figure, which obviously he is. And um, and there was a thing that occurred with uh, that was not right that happened to Chuck, which ticked me off. And obviously I, I wanted to also work on that. As far as I know, Chuck Zito, what I know of Chuck Zito, he's always been a gentleman. He's always been a gentleman with the around women Um uh, animals. He's always been, you know, he's been a good guy. You know, obviously he's knocked out quite a few people in his lifetime. And what's, you know, the thing too about Chuck is that he might, you know, knock the guy out, but then, you know, pick him up off the floor after he did and say, I'm sorry, I just had to do it because he was getting out of line. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, yeah. You know what I mean? He's not a bully. I, you know, I never saw him to be that, but what had happened and, you know, this role is like how he's telling his son to treat women. That's really who he is. And he's in flannel now. He's not in leather. And Chuck could probably really, really has a lot of roles in him, you know, out, you know, in that kind of role as the, you know, father figure, because he is that guy, you know. And what had happened was, is that when that thing went on with Man of War and Christy Mack, TMZ caught Chuck coming out of the restaurant. And of course, they took things out of context. And it blew up that made him look like somebody who he wasn't. And I says, you know what? that's he's in this scene and I'm going to craft it to show who he really is as a person. Cause that's who he really is. 
He's going to want to respect women. He's not going to do that. You understand? And he plays it to the T. And you know why he was able to play that to the T? You know why he's so good in that role? Guess why? Because that's who he is as a person. And I was able to, because I've seen that from him. When you know the actor, when you know the person as a writer, you could write for them because they're interesting as a person. They're going to be more interesting as a person, as an actor. You know, I see, you know, um, I mean, as far as the entire cast, man, the entire cast is great. But we're talking about a guy um, that came in there and just did a great job as did Katarina Michio. So, um, yeah, that's that. And I'm looking forward to working with them again, obviously. Yeah. So, you know what? And you, you told me uh, something that uh, Sylvester Stallone once said. When you get to the top, can you just say that phrase one more time? Yeah. You know, when I read it, I think it was uh, Sylvester Stallone's professor at Miami University. I told him, if you stick your head above the crowd, they're going to try and cut it off. And um, yeah, that's, that's just the way it is, you know, especially in our business. You know, unfortunately, I see that obviously in our business, but I, I see that in um, animal rescue, man. You know, like people are like, sometimes they just, I don't even know what they're about. They like criticize each other. They war with each other. And it's like, we just got to say, you know, it's, it's interesting. Sometimes I just go back to what Rodney King had said after the, you know, during the LA riots, you know, you're looking at Rodney King at that time, he's running from the cops because he probably knows he's a black guy in L.A. at that time. He's going to get a hose, right? There's really nobody had video cameras at that time. Just so happens there's the video cameras. He catches a beating. The guys get off for doing it. The city explodes. And he stands in front of the microphone. I don't know if they coerced him to say it or whatever, but he said, why can't we all just get along, man? You know? And like right now, what's going on with our country between red and blue? It's not red and blue, bro. It's red, white, and blue. And that's the way we're going to stand united. We're going to stand strong. And um, you know, and that's you know, that's you know, and and your art has to come from that as well. It has to be organic. You know, I, I can't. I, I it's very difficult for me to to see myself on sets in Hollywood at this point in time. I tell you, Larry. You know what? That's why I love you so much because you're so wise. You really are. You're a wise guy. You know what? I want to talk. No, you are. I want to talk about, you know what? You told me you were in a pool hall one time with Mikey Scars, and uh, they were filming uh, the movie Bullet with uh, Mickey Rock, and Mikey Scars told you to say something to Mickey Rock. But you know yeah. what? Let's let's hear that story, because that's a good story. Yeah. Well, going back, the whole deal is like the Milano's on 18th Avenue, for who's familiar, Bensonhurst, I guess the late 80s, 90s. <clears throat> and... um. Mickey, who come, Mickey knew Michael, and that's a whole other story that we talked about. It's a whole other thing. Mickey knew Michael, and Julian Temple, whose daughter is Juno Temple, who's playing in the offer, um, he was the director, and I got, you know, I went down to the restaurant, and that's how I ended up getting a part, you know. And, um, you know, Mikey was around the set. Tommy was there. I told you, I, Tommy, I can never say his last name. But Tony Marie mentioned him in when you guys did your first interview. Um, there was a couple people around. And um, Mikey's off the corner of the set. And he says to me, you know, could you, where's your script? What are you saying? So I show him the script. He says, I want you to put a line in there. I want you to say, why are you walking around with a sock on your head for? And I said, all right, let's do this. So I went, and you could tell when I say it, if you go to the close up of Mickey, you can see he's going, like that. He wants to clock me, but he knows he can't because it's really Mikey saying it. Because Mickey would come to Milano's dressed, you know, with a sock on his head. And I, you know, whether it's to do be a, be a rebel amongst the guys or whatever he wanted to do, you know what I'm saying? And, um, and you know, there's a whole Chuck Zito story, and I'm not going to bring it up. Chuck wants to say it around Bullet. That, you know, and, and Chuck gave me the full details after we did Saturday in the Park. I knew a little bit of it because I was in Bullet. And Chuck had called me before I started Bullet. And then, um, and that that's another story. But anyhow, so yeah, that was great. And Mikey was on there. And I told you this before, Mikey was never a wise guy with me, you know? And I think you said it initially, you know, he was kind of one of the guys that was kind of one of the good guys you play football with, you, you know? And, and when, when that happened with him, it happened with him, you know? And um, 
it is what it is, you know. But I'm glad to see that uh, hopefully things are good for him now. Yeah. And uh, so, you know what? Who was one of your favorite actors that you worked with? You know what? But, but before you tell me, how was it working with Pacino? Well, you know, the, the relationship was a strained relationship between father and son. And Pacino's a, a, a method actor. You know what? So I was on the set with Pacino on The Irishman. I was on the set for two days. Oh, I, yeah? I didn't get into The Irishman, but I was on the set and I got to shake Al's hand, which I was very privileged. He came over and, uh, you know, he was on the stage. He says, you know what? He says, I'm Jimmy Hoffa. Then he goes, well, I'm not really Jimmy Hoffa. You know, and then he started talking to us about acting, how to have fun with it and stuff like that. But yes, he's a method actor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Johnny Depp on that particular project, we got to, you know, he obviously he's into music. And, you know, we exchanged CDs. I got a CD in my garage. I still got to find it. Um, and um, a half full of rain. Yeah, I did a half full of rain too when I was in New York, when I was at Stratton. No, I was at HB. I think I did that play, Half Full of Rain. Um mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, Pacino was it was uh you know the it was uh, you know it was all right. We didn't talk much, you know. We didn't talk much when it was on the set. It was more like with Johnny, um, Johnny Depp was who was really talking, you know, the most. And um, I guess what happened, which is interesting, which you talk about, you know, things, you know. I remember Lou DiGiamo was the casting director of that movie, and I don't know why he came and said this to me, but on the set he came and said to me, he goes. Guess who just had a heart attack and died? I says, who? He goes, Joe from the Bronx. And I'm not going to say the last name. And he was a guy from the Bronx that was involved with Mickey. You know? And I was like, wow, really? Why would you even say that to me? I mean, I met the guy a few times, you know? And um, I found out later there was a real strong connection to this guy through my family. I was like, whoa. I didn't even, I, I found out when I was older. I was like, whoa, you know? So anyhow, well, that was Bullet with Mickey Rourke. Somehow it is what it is having being in New York. And um, what had happened, you want to talk about the what happened with the King of Queens after the King of Queens, get back to that? Yes. Um, yeah, so now what happened was is that <clears throat> NBC had friends and uh, uh, Seinfeld and their contracts were up after seven, seven years. So they were actually free agents to go to another network, which put NBC in not such a great place. Because now they they got to bend over on the deal negotiations. So next thing you know, Frasier, which was a Paramount, um, Friends was a Warner Brother NBC show. Seinfeld was Castle Rock, NBC. I don't know if there was somebody else involved with Castle Rock, and the, uh, Frasier was Paramount NBC, and Kristen was Paramount NBC, and the writers and the producers. We're like, we're going to ride the coattails of Frasier. We're either going to be before them or we're going to be after them, right? So we were all amped up. But now what happens is Frasier's contract is up and they start getting into these hardline negotiations with NBC. And that kind of put us not in such a great place. And then NBC changed presidents. Jeff Zucker took over and we became their stepchildren. And next thing you know, I had, uh, you know, I, I had, you know, mouths to feed and the Christian show was going bye bye. My mother went on a deathbed in Florida. Um, the guitar player got a gig with Martha Davis in the motels. I, um, yeah, Enid Alvarez, she's awesome. That's Enid Alvarez was involved with this project and I cannot tell you how much she had to do with the overall end product from her creativity. Um, is ca even in casting, man, she came in with her camera. She's an award-winning photojournalist. And she plays the bartender in the movie, and we got her with a Polaroid camera. And some of her photos are featured, like Katharina, you know? And um, But Enid, as far as helping with production design and keeping it authentic, because she's a Bronx girl, um, and then she did all the behind the scenes footage, which I'm going to, you're all going to get to see the behind the scenes footage from Saturday Park. When you see her photos, you're going to be like, what? You know? Um, and that was one of the things that we wanted. I wanted to make sure we captured all that behind the scenes stuff. Um, and uh, she was really telling me all along, she says, listen, Larry, 
<clears throat> you better have a backup for these actors just in case, because there's so much there. There's the, these guys, this is a lot, you know? And when Aaron Sorter came in, Aaron Sorter read for Mikey, but when he read for Mikey, I mean, he read for Danny. When he read for Danny, I was like, he's not Danny, he's Mikey. And I called the casting director. I says, he, I, says I want to sign Aaron Sorter right now as Mikey. She said, you mean Danny? He read for Danny. I says, no, he read for, he, he's Mikey. You want him to read for Mikey? I says, I don't have to. I know who he is. I know these characters. I know what this kid could do. <clears throat> the other kid that comes in to play Danny, he was good too. But he decided, he started thinking that he didn't have to show up for rehearsal, which is frightening. Because now we were going into the bowels of the of the Bronx to shoot. And this is going to be, you know, we're going to be grinding it, man. There was another actor, Ilya Constantine, who was really good. And Enid kept, she actually put his picture. That's the guy. That's the guy. That's the guy, you know. And when this kid didn't show up for a rehearsal, like five, six days for sh before shooting, I told the producers, I said, there's no way we could trust this kid to come through. We went to Brooklyn, we sat down with Ilya, and that kid, man, he worked his ass off. I mean, I had to work hard with him. It was a lot, man, and it was frightening because it's a role of a lifetime for both these kids, and um, and it was grueling. Had I wished that we had gotten you know more rehearsal? Yes, before we were shooting, but when I looked at the final product, I'm like, the kid pulled it off. The DP did it, you know, the storyline did it. But, um, yeah, so Ina was a big part of it. Once again, it goes back into it takes a it takes a team. It takes an army, you know, um, and I'm really looking forward to having you all see her behind the scenes photos. She's, she's really beautiful, really beautiful stuff. But um, you want to go back to the uh, NBC story? Go back to Kristen. Larry, Larry yeah. Before, yeah, before we go back there. Now, yeah. <clears throat> do you like staying behind the camera? Yeah. Now, tell me why so much behind the camera? Because, I mean, listen, you're a great actor. You really are. I love watching you. And, and you know what? Not everybody can do what you do. People think they can. They don't understand. When that camera rolls, you know what? You got to do your job, yeah. you know? And it's yeah. hard to, you know what, act. People think it's easy. It's very hard. No, man, you know, and that's that's part of the thing. You have to sleep consistently. You have to, um, you know, my hair's combed now, but most of the times I don't even like combing my hair, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you know, if somebody, it's nice when somebody got wardrobe they dress for you. I'm just not that type of, you know, person, but, you know, um, it's it's a lot of work. It's homework. You have to learn your lines. You have to think about what you want to do when you're going to do it. Then you have to draw on all those emotions and bring them up. You know, uh, I wouldn't throw, uh, you know, if, if something great came along, yeah, but I think that, you know, I didn't want to be in Saturday in the park as an actor because I, there's so many fantastic actors out there that, you know, deserve a window. And um, I said, no, that's what I want. I could have played the Chuck Zito part. I could have played the other part. I could have done, I could have done a couple of things, but I says, no, I don't want that. I want to work with these guys. You know what I mean? You know? And um, I think it's, man, it was, yeah, it's great to just not be in it. <laughs> Yeah, actually, uh, you know, I mean, that's a big undertaking, man. You know, that's yeah. serious stuff, man. You know, so it's like, you know, uh, it's uh, it's like catching, pitching, relief pitching, first base all at the same time. So, um, yeah, maybe I don't know what happens, Jimmy, but, you know, I got to tell you, you know, you talk about who is to work with out the gate. Sylvester Stallone was awesome. You know, I just come off of um, plays in New York. I was young. You know, and, you know, and then also, too, we were shooting in a prison and I didn't know. Yeah, there it is right there. And, you know, he was just awesome, man. I mean, I can't say it enough times. He wasn't a, to me, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't stuck up. He wasn't, you know, he was like, let's work on this together. Let's go over the dialogue. Let's do this together. And it worked out pretty good. That was fantastic to work with him. Definitely, without a doubt. And William Forsythe, too. I enjoy working with William Forsythe. I've done three movies with William Forsythe. I've been oh, in three. Another, you know, he's another great actor. He's a great actor, man. You know, and it's like, you know, where does a career path take? You know, you know, if if uh, the opportunities to work with the director and the writer on certain projects, you know, he maybe he didn't get the gig 
for reasons other than ability to be a great actor. And, you know, that's what happens in the business, man. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, you know what? Look, looking at your career, your acting career, you know what? You are right beside them. You really are. You worked with this guy. You worked with Sean Penn. You worked with uh, Stallone. You worked with Pacino, Johnny Depp. I mean, Mickey Walk. Listen, you yeah. are right beside them. Okay? Yeah. They ain't no better than you, believe me. Because Thank I'm telling you, you're a great actor. Thank you. I appreciate that, you know? Um, I think that, you know, as far as, obviously, there's different kinds of actors, you know? And like you said, and um, and it goes back to two, and you know that. that wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me ask you. How yeah. was it when you played Frankie Eyelashes? Uh, it was great, man. <laughs> you know, I got once I got to tell you right now, right straight up, what made it great was that Michael was on the set and Tommy was on the set. Another kid named Thomas was on the set and Casper was there and Jose, my my friends from the Bronx, and we were in Harlem, and you know that's a different and a lot of the guys that were around, you know. And it was it was just a different vibe, man. You know, it was cool. It was cool, man. Yeah, that was that was good stuff. Now this photo over here is that thin. Yep, that's a thin red line. That's Danny Hawk and Matty Doran, who's a star, uh, an actor from Australia. Big big production there. That was an experience. Yeah, that was a beautiful thing, man. A lot of people wanted to be in that movie and they didn't get in, and I got in. I got that part because of an actor by the name of Donald Logue. And how my career has gone a lot of ways, Debbie Mazar. Do you know Debbie Mazar? You got to know Debbie Mazar, Entourage. She was in Goodfellas, Trees Lounge. She's yeah, fantastic. I know, I know who you're talking about. She was Madonna's. Uh, she started with Madonna. She introduced me to Madonna. And I did the video of Madonna. She introduced me to uh, Stephen Bochco, Billy Finkelstein. She was on a show called Civil War. She got me an audition. I worked alongside Frankie Vincent, I think, in that one. Um, and I went to L.A. Law and then NYPD Blue because it was the same camp. So in reality is in that career path into TV, it was Debbie Mazar. It really wasn't like agents really looking hard for me, you know. I had met De Debbie because we had had the same agent. And then she had gotten Civil Wars after Goodfellas. And when she did Civil Wars, um, there was a part in there. And she had him. I came in. And I read. I went down to Fox Studio on Pico. I read. I got the part. And Billy uh, William Finkelstein, he loved me. He was a cab driver in New York. I drove a cab in New York. We had a lot of common. We got on. So then when L.A. Law came up, so I went from... Debbie introduced me to Civil War, Civil Wars to L.A. Law, L.A. Law to NYPD Blue. Then a show comes up, Public Morals. This goes back to the contract thing where I should have learned my lesson on this one. And I went and got, I went and had to end up doing a lot of things I had to do after Kristen. But those things actually built a lot of great character and a lot of great stories as well. So, and I have no regrets, believe me. I actually, looking back on those times between the King of Queens and the time I actually did laugh, kill, laugh. It was rough, and, but like it was fun. So, um, and you, know, Larry, you, you, turned, right. you turned me on to laugh, kill, laugh. And everyone out there, you have to see that film, laugh, kill, laugh. I'm telling you, it's a great film with a uh, William Forsythe. William Forsyth. And, uh, yeah, is Tom Sizemore in that too? Tom Sizemore is in it. Tom Agnello shot that. Tom Agnello is a really good director of photography. I've been calling him, Tom, call me back. I want you to shoot something. He shot it, really. It's a beautiful picture, right? Yeah, it he is. It's a beautiful picture. And that was that was cool, too, man. You know, um, William Forsythe, once again. Yeah. So what happened now with public morals? Now what happens is, is that now I'm climbing up, and I end up getting Bochco calls me in for a show called Public Morals. It was a sitcom. Les Moonves just took over CBS. And it was one of their new projects Jay Tossers was writing. I got cast in his public morals. It was my first sitcom to go on stage. And, and that's where I met Donald Logue. And we were guaranteed on the air once again, 1996, guaranteed on the air. That was my first, you know, my first rodeo with guaranteed first on the air, you know. And um, they butted heads. The producers butted heads with the network, so on and so forth. And it got canned. 
And but Donald Logue, we had met, and Donald Logue went to go read for a show uh, for the Ten Red Line. And he called the cat, told the casting director, "There's no way you could cast this role of Mozzie without seeing an actor by the name of Larry Romano." And so next thing you know, you know, Donald Logue was the one. It wasn't agents, it wasn't managers. It was Donald Logue. Hmm. And next thing you know, I'm on the Ten Red Line, and from the Ten Red Line was the King of Queens. And um, well, public morals, Donnie Brasco, so on and forth. But um, you know, what what happened end up happening with Kristen is that the, we became the stepchild. You know. They changed the president. They butted heads all because of those negotiations that were hardlining that had nothing to do with us, hardlining with the studios. And um, and the next thing you know, I mean, my, my the band dis, dis, dissolved, yeah, you know, and that was an investment. That was a financial investment that I was like, and we were so close. So I mean, with Hollywood Reporter, Heavy Metal Kings in the New Millennium, we can't get, you know, wow, you know, so close. And I had, I had sunk a lot of dough into it. And um, and that's when, um, you know, I kept writing screenplays. I was working with a guy who di- um, directed Rocky, Karate Kid, John Abelson. I learned a lot of storytelling. Yep, Alpha Justice. That was, there's a whole other story with Alpha Justice. We could go through those movies and we could have a Brooklyn story on Alpha Justice too, you know, that. And Bullet, you know. So um, at that time... You know, I wasn't going to sell my soul for, for it, man. You know, I had mouths to feed and I was going to figure it out. And between my wife and I, we figured it out and we made it happen. You know, and we got it through in the interim. And um, and Larry, you know what? You speak about your wife. I know you had some hardships in your life, too. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I thank the Lord. I Listen, man, I'm an American. Okay. When we did the King of Queens, Lee is a Scientologist, or was. Patton Oswalt's an atheist. And I'm grateful to be an American that we all have the choice to believe what we believe. What I do is that I always thank God. I thank Jesus Christ. I thank God. You know what I mean? Amen. And, and I respect, right, exactly. And I respect everybody else's beliefs of what they want to believe. And I, I just thank God that I'm still here. And it really wasn't, you know, there's been hiccups, obviously. There's all, you know, hiccups. We all go through some stuff. But um, I've learned down through the years, you know, walking through the subways and I see the looks on people's faces. As you grow older, you start to say, you don't know what's on that guy's mind. My mother used to tell me stuff like that, too. She used to say, you know, you see somebody over there, maybe they got a puss on their face or something like that. You don't know. You know what I mean? You don't know. You don't want to start arguing. Why give a guy a hard time? Road rage. Guy's mad. You know, he just wrote an alimony check to his wife and his kids are calling some other guy, Uncle Daddy. You know, he's got to go to work and now he's in a car that's breaking down and you just half cut him off. Why you got to bust the guy's ball some more? You know what I mean? You don't know. I, I'm always like that. Listen, go over there. You know, I'm sorry. You know, oh yeah, you're right. You know, like that, you know. It's okay. Sorry. You know, Larry, I got a question for you quick. How was it? Did you uh, interact with Tupac Shakur? Just met him briefly. You know, uh, one of the guys that I met with, with Jesse Torero, who directed a lot of music videos was 50 Cent down in the set of one of his videos before he blew up. How was 50 Cent? He was real cool, man. Yeah, it was a brief hello, how are you? You know, I had known Jesse. Jesse had done a few uh, videos and he did a couple movies. So it was like that, yeah. Um, yeah, fifty's a big shot now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, he had some good stuff going on. I mean, he got he what he got shot like nine times, right? Yes. Link, three hundred miles. He's lucky. Talk about taking some hard lumps. He, <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah. I, I forget it. Um. So that's really where how that all occurred, you know, and how it all, you know. I says, listen, I'm not, you know, and there were things that what had happened also too on the set of Kristen, it was at a time when they were doing the recount between Bush and Gore. And um, there was a few meetings I went on because I write TV shows too. A few meetings that I went on with very powerful agents and, you know, I was being baited, you know, they were seeing who I wanted to be president before, even like during the primaries, you know, and, you know, they would say things like, you know, this is the guy, that's the guy. They were I, filling you out. Yeah, you know, and I didn't like it. 
you know. I didn't like it at all, you know, because you're dealing with 50 states here, you know. You're dealing with a lot of different cultures. You're dealing with a lot of different people here, you know. So you're not going to – and what, what I've figured out is that what we've gone through recently is because what happens is, is that the left has diversified their investment portfolio to include entertainment. And, you know, maybe the right is you know, conservatives. They got the stocks. They got the bonds. They got the real estate. But they're really not involved in the arts. And a lot of them are just, you know, there's not. Meanwhile, the left, they are. So but when you are controlling the entertainment, you're controlling the narrative. You're controlling the propaganda. So in the 80s, the 90s, the parents would go to the school, go to the store, go to the Palm of Video, Blockbuster. The kids get a video. They get a video. Parents go in the room, watch their video. Kids out there watching their video. Then they watch it again. They watch it again. Underlying in there, there's things. That they're going to eventually move along. When you go to produce a screenplay, there's parameters that you used to come up against. You know, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. This guy, you know, colors, racist. This play roles I lost because I wasn't the right color. And, and um, you know, while that's going on, I mean, I'm like, I'm just like not about it, man. You know, you know, I'm just not about that whole deal. And I was on the set and it was going back and forth and it was just hard, hard saying very harsh things about Bush. And I don't like them. I don't. I don't. I don't like any of those guys, man. I went, my mom must have been six, seven years old on Baychester Avenue in the Bronx with Uncle Mike, who was born in 1913. He was a politician. He's handing out pencils and paper and nail files. And we went back in the car, Uncle Mike, Uncle Mike, that guy's a nice guy. Look, he gave us all this. You're going to vote for him? You're going to vote for him? And Uncle Mike, this is old school wisdom. He's giving away ice in the wintertime. He's a politician. You don't trust him. And that's the problem right now. You got You can't look up to a politician like he's a rock star or that he could do no wrong because guess what? You know, Uncle Mike's wife and Nancy used to say they're doing the best they can. That's why there's a racist on the end of pencils. People make mistakes, but she's real old school and a little naive too. And she was, you know, holier than thou really, you know, but you can't adore these people, you know, and you can't, you know, just the whole red, white, red and blue thing. It's just, like, uh, no, so as it's going on, somebody said, I hope Dick Cheney has a heart attack and dies. And that was the draw for me. As a matter of fact, Al Franken had been on the set a few times. He was friends with the writers. He didn't know what to make of me, Jimmy. I used to come to the Paramount lot. This particular character, I wore a suit. He was kind of a, a John, John Tenney kind of played a Trump kind of character, a developer in New York. And I was his guy. And it's probably on YouTube. And you know, Al Franken would come to the set, but I would come to the set every day in Paramount. I used to bring my, I had a female shepherd where I smoked cigar with his suit. I had my father's pinky ring. They didn't know, what to, he didn't know what to think about me, Al Franken. He didn't know what to think about me. You know? But when that woman said that, I said, that's it. I mean, that's it. I mean, you're supposed to be, oh, so sweet. I said, I'm sick of this shit, man. You just wish somebody have a heart attack and die over this. Okay, you don't like the guy that much, but that's what you're saying? I said, you're the people that go and you adopt kids from other countries. You live behind a gated mansion. And then you drive past the poverty, poverty and all the people of color that you pretend you want to support on your way while you're locking the doors. And you got a gated community. And you don't like the fact that some other guy's got a firearm to protect his family. Because if he calls 911 like Uvalde, why, why do you get that? Why do you get the West Tech come to the place? Why do you get the gated community? Why do you get that? And I got to listen to you garble this shit? The last thing I want to do is get behind the people you want because obviously we're not the same people. And I at points, you know, Jimmy, I don't have a filter. I don't care, man. I'm out. If that's it, I'm blacklisted, man. That's it. And that's fine. Because you know what? There's a lot of people that I just really. You're, black, you're blacklisted like James Woods. Yeah, pretty much. And you know what? way the world goes right now, we don't need them. Okay? We don't need them. And that's it. And it's got to change. I wish, I, you know, you know, there's a lot of these, these, uh, these celebrities, they got behind and they go and they campaign for people. 
Well, they don't feel the ramifications of what they're pushing. You understand? Because they're, they're loaded. They're not suffering from $10 a gallon of gas like these truckers are, you know? And it's kind of always been who, you know, it's been like the argument. I You know, here's another thing too, Jimmy. You know, it's just, it ain't no fun unless my friends get some. What's the use of you living so large and everybody else around you, you got to look at them in misery? To me, it don't feel good. I can't just, you know, do that, bro, you know? And um, and a lot of that is what goes on over there. You know? Larry, Larry, this is why I love you, because you, you say it the way it is. And that's why we're we're good together here, you know what I mean? Because you're a real dude, you know what I mean? You've seen where you had to see, and you come out the other side, and you you know what's up. And that's what, like, we talked about this a yes. little bit, too. It's going to be guys like us for the, for the new generation to say, hey, listen, man, you know, what Tommy Dades wants to do with the boxing, I'm so far behind that, bro. It would be so awesome to be able to put some money behind that so you could get those boxing teams and those projects and those places where the kids need a father image. And not that they go and beat each other up, that they, but the respect of the science of the sport and the physicality. And, and for the kids that aren't athletic, we need to get them into the music. And, and bring that back in there. And, and music comes the the beast, right? You know, they play the music. Oh, not, every, not every kid's athletic, you know? Yep. Um, it's the Whitney Houston song. Children Tommy, are yes. And Tommy Dage, that's my guy. I love that guy, too. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, he's interesting to listen to, Tommy. You know, I mean, he's uh, he's got a great story. I mean, man, some of the stuff that he was talking about, I was like, wow. About the kid that was laying outside his house looking to hit him. Yes. John Papa. I mean, like, come on, man. You know, I mean, I mean, but Jimmy, you act, you navigated those streets. Like, yeah. I don't, I, you na- that's genius stuff, bro, because you navigated those streets, bro. That's not easy. You know, well, you know, you know what it is when you see some of your friends getting murdered. Now you're on alert at all times. Right. You know, you're carrying a piece and uh, you're, you're expecting the unknown. You know, you know not to trust nobody. You know not to get in a car no more. When someone calls you and says, Jimmy, can you pass by my house? You know why? Okay. What's this guy want to talk to me for? You know? So, right. uh, but TB says, Jimmy, bring Sammy on for a live chat. So, Sammy, if you're listening. Sammy the Bull? Yeah, Sammy the Bull. If you're listening, you got to come on, Sammy. We're waiting for you. These guys want to hear you. They want to see you. Sammy. So, my Sammy the Bull story is, I told you. I told you. Remember a little bit? Yeah. That, that, tell to the audience. So I used to be around in a place called Milano's on 18th Avenue. And a lot of the guys there, Bobby Borrell, may he rest in peace, Michael, uh, Jackie. And, um, you know, to me, they were, I thought they were like John Gotti's right hand man. I you never met Look who's out Mikey's, there. You know, Mikey Scars. That's, I think that's Mikey Scars' son. I yeah. hear, uh, I hear of funny stories on the set of Bullet. So uh, he might have heard some stories from his dad. Yeah, you know, um, yeah. Well, I remember just- Michael, I remember him when he was a baby. He was at Cafe Billiards. I think it was across the street from Oriental Manor. He, uh, Michael was. Uh, they were just open up the Cafe Billiards, and he was playing video games. That's where he actually. That's where Michael got married. Orient, Oriental Manor. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he was playing the video games with, and uh, I remember that. Yeah. But yeah, finish the same with a bull story. So my cousin, Joey Givenazzo, who I love dearly, he's memories video on Staten Island, Joey G. He's done all the weddings. And I mean, he's done all the weddings. And he says to me one Saturday night, come on, what do you want? What are you doing? You want to go see Big John? I said, Big John, who? What do you mean Big John? Who? Come on, I got to do a wedding for for um, Tommy Bellotti's son. At the, I think it was where the Shalomar used to be. So I was like, you know what? The in-laws are over. I put on a tie. I go, let's go. So we go, and as we're walking in, Joey, Joey's like 84 now. He stops. He looks over there. I says, what are you doing? He goes, I'm looking for the van with the FBI. You know, he's kind of being a little, but that, you know that's what's happening. So we walk in there and everything, and I saw some, I saw like Jackie. I think he was in the back room or whatever, you know, but they were in their own room. And then me and Joey walking around, I guess I was helping him setting up, and we went up like, I think it was on a catwalk, if I remember correctly. And I see this guy walking towards us. 
Hey, Joey, how are you? Hey, Sammy, how you doing? I say, hey, Sammy, this is my cousin, Lawrence. I say, hey, Sammy, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Hey, Lawrence, how you doing? So he went this way, and we went that way. And I, and he goes to me, he goes, you just met John Gotti's right-hand man. And I says, bro, are you kidding me? Bobby Borriello, Jackie, that, that's that's there. He goes, Joey says, that's how much you know. And looking back on it, I say, that was mafioso. He's the underboss. I was in that restaurant all the time, bro. I was at Cafe Billiards. I was there all the time. I never heard the name. Of course, maybe he was over in that section more where you guys were. I was on 18th Avenue, 7 Bay, Bay Ridge Parkway, right around there. I was like in there a little bit, you know, so I don't know. But I never heard the guy's name, yeah. you know. And you kind of think about it. Like, imagine if, <clears throat> you know. If, the whole the whole Bensonhurst knew his name. <laughs> Yeah, but I didn't know it because I was kind of, you know, I didn't grow up there. I was I was in Mount Vernon, Yonkers, then went to Rockland County. As soon as I could drive, I got out of, I, you know, I went and lived on the south side of Mount Vernon with my aunt Nancy and Uncle Mike. And then I was in Queens, Staten Island. And it, it, how I met my, my brother, who may rest in peace, just passed away. He introduced me to a guy named Dante. Dante introduced me to a guy named Mario. Mario introduced me to Joe Sirico. And then Joe Sirico found out that my grandmother came from San Martino, Calabria. Yeah, go ahead. Joe Sirico, Marco Polo. Marco Polo. Yes. And then from the Marco Polo, Mario left the Marco Polo and he started Milano's. And then I went to Milano's. So, you know what I mean? Like, I was new in the neighborhood. So, I really didn't. You know what I mean? That was, um, yeah, I was new, you know. So, I never heard that name, Sammy the Bull. I didn't know who he was. You know, which I, in reality, is. Let's face it. That's the way we really should be, right? Absolutely. You're supposed yeah. to be underground. Underground, man. You know. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So um, that's what's going on. That's what's. Uh, that was the. Um, you know, up until you know, filming uh, Saturday in the Park. You know, the, what happened with the movies and and uh, after after uh, the BAM dissolved after they dissolved you know it was just you know i started doing different things you know which would be a tv series unto itself uh larry we got 252 people in the chat oh fantastic just to, yeah just to let you know cool man anybody uh yeah so uh yeah so that's really you know i mean up until Saturday in the Park, and now the whole goal is that what we're doing is that, you know, Saturday in the Park, the movie's going to come out. We're going to start. Yeah, so, the, yeah, so when are we going to see the Saturday in the Park? I'm looking around November 11th. Okay. You know, we want to do some charity screenings. Um, I'm very big on, like, doing charitable work where, you know, where a donor would buy the house and donate the tickets to a local art school, show the film, do a Q&A, and the money goes to a charity. One charity I'm working with is called Gateway to Hope. I do cameos for Gateway to Hope, and the money goes right to Gateway to Hope. And what Gateway to Hope does is that when you're going through cancer, you know, it's not easy to pay your bills because you can't work, you know. So they help out with bills, um, and they help out with giving rides to the chemo radiation. And um, so that's something that, you know, I'm very passionate about, animals. And, uh, and, and Larry, just to let you know, uh, I'm here to help you. So anything you want to do on my channel, you just notify me. And you know I'm in your corner. So, Thank you. Uh, yeah. Just to, just to let you know. But yeah. uh, Diana McKean wants to know, is there any way to hear Larry's music? Yeah, you know, I'm figuring out how, how to do that. Um, I'm on, I guess, if you go to LarryRomano.com, uh, um, there's some SoundCloud clips on there for right now. And, um, you know, I'm still in the process of, like, setting up the website. And um, I want to put that music out there, you know, put a lot of love into the music. I put a lot of love into this, into the lyrics, and um, I worked with a lot of talented musicians. And I'm also looking forward to meeting, you know, new musicians. There's a couple of cats that I've been talking with, and um, I actually I don't know if you can see it. I got a drum set behind me, so yeah, I get yeah, to do yeah, drums every day. Yeah, so I get on the drums, I can play, and and just start being creative again, man. And um, yeah, God bless you too, Ryan. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you very much. Yep. Um. Uh, what else? No, yeah, you were saying about the animals. You love animals. 
So as far as animals are concerned, uh, I could, uh, you know, I worked, uh, did a lot of research called uh, something I came up with and it really comes down to breeding laws. You know, the breeders, if you're going to breed animals in your backyard, in your basement, what happens is, is those animals, a lot of them don't get adopted or they get adopted out to the people who really don't know how to train the animals and give the animals proper love. Those are the animals that end up in cages and in the Sarah McLaughlin video, you know, and who wants to watch those animals in cages, you know, like that. And because, so, people, because people are doing it to make a profit, right? Right. So I, I, you know, I came up with this thing and this is something Chuck Zito said to me one time everybody's entitled to make a living. All right. So Chuck said that to me one time outside of a, a bar one, when there was the premiere for 29th street and there was a lot of photographers and they were getting a little out. And I said, look at these guys. And he goes, everybody has a right to make a living. So I took that. I says, everybody has a right to make a living, but they don't have a right to make it off another living life. And what I mean by that, you can't make money just by breeding creatures that animals and then discard them like they, you know, no, these are beautiful creatures. These are to be, these are to be cherished. Okay. So if you're going to breed animals, um, <laughs> cop land with Stallone. That's another, that was one of my favorite Stallone. Mike, Mike De Leonardo, he goes, Hey, Larry, what happened with Copland? My father said he was trying to get you a role. There's, uh, I don't know what happened with Copland, you know? I really don't, you know? Um, but um, that's a really great movie with Sylvester Stallone. I really love that movie, Copland. I might go watch it later on tonight. See, I wish Sly would do more roles like that. My favorite, my favorite guy, Mike, uh, what's his name? Rappaport's in Rappaport's on there. Yeah, he's great. That's a great cast. That's a great cast. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, when my, if Michael, my, I saw Michael the other day on the, on the, on a podcast too. And I was like, I mean, there's some stories that if he wanted to share that we could talk about, you know, um, down through what in the time, you know, in the years with Mickey and whatever, you know, and, and well, Michael well, listen, Michael is invited to come on this show anytime with you. Anytime Michael wants yeah. to come on and, uh, you know, Larry wants to come on with Michael, they could talk about, you know, on the set of Bullet and make us, uh, you know, give us a little uh, stories. We would love to have that. Out for justice. I'll ask Michael, my, ask your father if he remembers out for justice when we went to the diner across the street from the set. I think, I don't know what diner was. It was Bobby. I think Noel was there. And we were there at the diner and I wasn't in Alpha Justice, but I was there with them. And then we went across the street. We were looking at the scene that just happened where William Forsythe's character went up to the guy and gave him the business, you know, and we were across the street from the scene. And then what Bobby said to us, it was funny, you know, um, Bobby Borriello was funny. He was, uh, I mean, I just has a lot of laughs, you know, just being in his vicinity. Um, I remember when uh, when it happened. Um, somebody called me from New York, um, and I was, you know, you know, that was somebody that, like I said, we had laughs together. You know what I mean? And he introduced me to Ray Sharkey. Um, Ray Sharkey, I, I used to love Ray Sharkey. Yeah, Ray Sharkey. You know, here's I tell you, Leah. Let's talk about Leah for a second. I right? love I love that show, Wise Guy. Wise Guy with. Um, uh, what's his name? Yeah, uh, Ken Wall. Ken Wall, right. So then Ray Sharkey, so check this out. Now, Ray Sharkey was with Herbie Nannis. <clears throat> Herbie Nannis was a manager. He used to manage Chicago. He had a lot of, he managed Stallone for a while, Albert Brooks. And um, and after Wise Guy, Herbie got him a show, a sitcom. Ed Weinberger was the producer. He had done Cheers at the time. Julie Bavasso was in the show because she played the mother in Saturday, Saturday Night Fever. And Leah was in the show. And I went to the to the taping of the show with Ch Johnny Cha Cha, who was another guy that I miss. Man, he, he was another person that I had a lot of laughs being around Johnny Cha Cha. And we went to the taping, and that's when I first saw Leah on stage. And I was like, "Wow, you know what I'm saying to you? Like she was good off the bat. You could tell she had skills. You know, she would hit a mark. She would say a line. If she missed a line, she knew how to go back." And start all over again. 
And she was really good. You know, I don't know how old she was. She was pretty young at that. It was before Saved by the Bell. Now, when we end up on doing the King of Queens together, <clears throat> Leah's a pro, man. And she had experience. She's from you my know? neighborhood. Yeah, you told me. You knew it yes. from your neighborhood. Yeah, I grew up with her. She held the pilot together. She really did because of her experience and her talent. And she, you know, we shot till four o'clock in the morning on that pilot. But, um, you know, that's that was that was part of the equation of, you know, making the show a hit show was Leah. Leah's professionalism. Leah was good, man. You know, Leah was the one all experience. Kevin really didn't have that much experience before that, you know. But, um, yeah, so I had met um, Ray Sharkey over there through Bobby B when that was that. And then, um, yeah, so then, uh, you know, when I had heard that he had, uh, what had happened, um, I told you I used to have nightmares. You know, there was a, one night where I was in, on Simpson Street. I had friends on Simpson Street in the Bronx. Um, and, uh, you know, we just hang out in the corner, laugh. And it's a little different up there, obviously, Simpson Street in the South Bronx, you know. And uh, but uh, I had friends there and I was making my way back to Staten Island. I said, let me stop at Milano's, you know, I'm gonna stop at Milano's. And when I stopped at Milano's, Bobby was at the table with a couple of guys. Of course, I wasn't going to go up there. But I sat at the bar and he asked for me to go to sit down with them. I went and sat down. We drank, drank Charus. You know, he liked to drink Charus. We're laughing, man. You know, later on, I went to Pastel's, but Bobby wasn't there. But and uh, he says to me, hey, boo, where you coming from? I said, oh, I was just up on Simpson Street. Said, Simpson Street in the Bronx. I says, yeah. He goes, oh, you better be careful up there. It's bad up there. I said, yeah, well, I know people. I have my friends, my friends up there. And um, and then after what had happened to him, I would have, you know, some nightmares where he was like, you know, he had a black Lincoln at one time where we were driving past his house and he would say to me, he would say, hey, boo, remember I told you to be careful up on Simpson Street? Look what happened to me. They got me in my own driveway. And now you would haunt me, you know, haunt me. And um, yeah, you know, uh, that was, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, this is uh, Don, know, Don, Don Burling. He says, what an inspirational life and talk about surviving many of life's potholes. A story of patience for the beginning, persistence and to the very end, truly incredible. And for that, I thank God, man. You know, I thank you, Don. Yes, persistence has been there. And I thank God that he's given me some breaks to be able to, um, you know, prevail, you know, to be able to prevail. And um, without, listen, without God or Jesus in your life, you ain't going nowhere. You know that. I, yeah, you know, it is nice to have faith. You know, like I said, the King of Queens was a Scientologist and an atheist. And I think I'm grateful I'm an American that we have the rights to do that. That's fine, you know. But that is a vibe, you know, that's a vibe. You know, I know personally when I see people on the street, my mother used to say, and there's that song from back in the day, there but for the grace of God goes I. You know, when I see somebody on the corner, when I see somebody, I look at that, I don't look down at them, man. I say, there but for the grace of God goes I. I don't know if that person got into a car accident, they didn't get the right medical treatment, can't walk. You just don't know, man. You know, and, um, you know, uh, I just wish that we would have a situation where we would take care of our people here that we could see in America, the homeless, the people who don't have health care, the people that are struggling, the food. I just it would be really nice if we just had somebody that would. You know what? That's what, that, that's, that's, what, you know what that's what makes me mad about this country. Is yeah. that we have so many people starving, we have so many people homeless, we have so many people out of health care, but we're worried about everyone else in other countries. Right. And Not we don't even people. right. And that's gotta stop, man. Yes. You know, and it just has to stop. I mean, I think I think in a lot of ways, you know, it's like an alcoholic or a drug addict, they gotta hit bottom. And unfortunately for our country as an as a whole, you know, we have to all hit bottom together. You know, there were people that just, you know, and I'm not saying that I'm not rooting for anybody because I don't trust any of them. You know, I, I don't trust. I don't put my faith in these guys 100 percent. You know, there are things that one guy might say or one woman might say from the far left that makes absolute sense. 
You know, I mean, I, I, you can never think that it was possible that de Blasio could ever make somebody look, look like a bad person. But I watch an interview with him on Sean Hannity and de Blasio is talking about no meat Monday for school lunch. Like, in other words, no soda in the school. And Hannity is talking about how he grew up in a candy shop eating Snickers. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, the last thing I want my kids or any kids around is is growing up on Snickers bars. Like, de Blasio doesn't, whether he's true or not in what he wants to do or whether he wants to, but his words at least, we don't want to feed these kids crap. And I think that's another thing that we got to take. What are we feeding these kids, man? You're feeding them processed food, you know? It's like, you know, so like I says, I'm not a lefty. I'm not a righty. I'm going to see who's this guy saying this, this one saying that one over there. I trust neither one of you, but I like it in the middle. You know what I mean? So, in the so, middle. So, all right. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, sure. But uh, let me, uh, okay. Do you remember Brett Retina? He was on record with Michael Jr.'s father, Mikey Scars. I don't remember that. No, Brett Ratner is a big time uh, director. Yeah. And then he says, uh, he sends his regards to both of you. I'm sure he's Thank watching. You. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Now, yeah. I got another question. Did you ever work with, because Graffiti Ma asked the question, I didn't get to it. Did you ever work with Dennis Farina? Because I'm a big fan of Dennis Farina. I, I, I love Dennis Farina. Nah, never did. No, uh, I might have met him. Nah, never. But yeah, he was great. You know, I love that Get Shorty. Which yeah, all no, he's great. Yeah, and Get Shorty, he's great. <laughs> he's running amok. He's yeah. right, things are running amok, he says. And then he also played that other movie with uh, De Niro, uh, where he's a bounty hunter or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, he's a gangster. I forgot the name of it. George Gallo wrote it. And Pete Antico was De Niro's yeah. stunt double. What the fuck? Midnight Run, Midnight Run. Midnight there you go, run. Midnight Run. Yes. Midnight Run, yeah, yeah. There you go, yep. Yeah, yeah, yep. Midnight Run. Um, who's that? That's, uh, that's Ryan Brown. Uh, Larry, not sure of your musical taste, but I recommend listening to the song Give Me Your Eyes by a man named Brandon Heap. He is a Christian artist. It touches on everything you're saying. Now check it out. Brandon Heath. Uh, I have a question over here. Edwin, Edwin Geminez. Mr. Larry, did you ever visit Joe's and Joe's Italian restaurant on Castle Hill, Bronx? That's a strong possibility. Castle Hill in the Bronx, definitely. I spent a lot of time there. I used to hang out. I spent some time in the Castle Hill houses. And there was a boxing gym over there. They had a lot of boxes coming out of Castle Hill. Tough neighborhood. Yeah, it could be, yeah. Castle Hill. That's a badass name if you think about it. Castle Hill. You know right? Yes. Gun Hill. Bronx got some good name. Gun Hill Road. Now you know what? Since uh and and you know what, since tomorrow's Father's Day, okay, yeah. we had this conversation, you and I. Uh, you know, I wanna watch I wanna wish you a happy Father's Day to everyone mm -hmm. out there. I wanna wish you all a happy Father's Day. I hope you all get to spend it with your children and someone you love and that someone loves you because uh, you know what, being a father is very precious, you know, uh, especially to your children, you know what I mean? Because you're the first role model that they know. So let's talk about Father's Day for a minute. Absolutely. You know, um, um, you know, two important, really important roles, obviously fathers and mothers, you know? Yes. And, um, you know, my father, he was born in 1923. He grew up hard. He was the oldest son uh, of an Italian family, uh, Italian-American, Harlem, the Bronx. And he worked hard and, you know, he, wor he worked his ass off, you know. He went to the sixth grade and, you know, he would have, you know, little talks. But they would, I could tell you, you know, a different era, you know. You know, they have talks. He told me that he loved me twice. And one of the times he told me that he loved me was when Aaron Boone hit that home run against the Red Sox <laughs> <laughs> to beat the, to send the Yanks to the World Series because he would be in Florida and I would be in California, would be on the phone watching the Yankees and the Red Sox. And when when Boone hit the home run, I love you, Pop. I love you. I love you too. And that's one of two times I can remember my father saying that he loves me. But I knew he loved me, obviously. Um, and you know, he said something to me, and I don't want to choke up too much, but you know, 
when um, I was, uh, you know, with the mother of my children, you know, you know, obviously there's ups and downs and all of that before we even got married. My father said to me, he says, I'm going to tell you one thing right now. That girl will make a great mother. And I'm going to tell you right now, he was right. And it's, it does, it's, it, it helps because she allowed me to be the best father I could be. You know, I'm an artist. Um, I'm not, you know, I mean, one of the, one of our, Elias Kateas used to observe us. And he says, you're a perfect combination because she's really stable and grounded and she's there and you're just, you know, but you all got the same goal, you know, you all have the same goal. Um, and that's what, you know, it really enabled me to be, you know what I mean? Of course, there's always going to be bickering and fighting. And there was, you know, a couple of times when I got down in front of the family, I said, dear Lord Jesus Christ, please help us, help us get this kid on the right track. Please do anything you can. Please help us get this kid on the right track. On my knees, bro, in the living room on a Sunday. And on Monday, he came and he got me. And everything went from there. And that was like, you know, so it's not easy. You know what I mean? Um, it's, it, there is sacrifice. Um, there's a lot of fathers that out there that think that just buying material stuff is what's going to do it. But that's not going to do it. You need to take your kid fishing. You need to sit down and talk to the kid. So, you know, sometimes it's just better. You know, some of these movies that they make, you know, turn them off, man. They're not worth it. If you're not going to get something from it, I, I got into the movie business because I got something from it. I, uh, Rocky, it's just it's a movie of his spirit. You know what I mean? Even The Godfather, I believed in America. You know, there's a lot to learn there. Saturday Night Fever, there's ways of killing yourself without killing yourself. We see people all the time. I had somebody close to me because a kid growing up, he, he pointed that out to me growing up, that scene, there's ways of killing yourself without killing yourself. And then he killed himself. And um, those are the movies that you should be sitting down with your kids and watching, you know, and then go for a walk in the woods. Don't watch this crap, all this Kardashian crap and all that yelling. And, and another thing too, you know, about this bling bling stuff. Stop making it about the material, man. Make it about the spiritual. You know? That's um, this that, that's this generation. And they've been sold that by the propaganda, by the media, by the movies, because they go and see the movies where the guy got the fast car. Now, this fast and furious movie, to me, that shouldn't even be out. Because then these kids go get these cars and they go kill themselves or they kill innocent people. It's very, I don't even know uh, what the word would be, irresponsible of, for them to continually put that stuff out there. I don't like it, man. You know, I don't like it. I think it's, you know, it's showing these kids to go out and do it. You're going to go out and emulate. Some guy, when I first started watching, uh, getting into the movies, his old time producer says he saw the Godfather went out and bought the hat. You know, you see Rocky, you go and eat the, the eggs with the raw eggs. You know, Saturday Night Fever. You know I had a white suit, you know? So now you go, these kids, they go watch Fast and Furious. They're going to go, um, you know? And um, and the video games. I worked for Sony. We used to get the video games. Those video games never made it through my front door. Never. Those kids were not allowed to see video games. Because it just, you know, I mean, they'll play off at the end if you're going to go be in the military and control airplanes from far away. You know, but for to have the kids sit there and play video games, you know, it's not good for their 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 physical. You know, you, I mean, you yourself, you, all those stories you had, great times playing sports, kept you, you know, in shape. Yeah, we grew up. We grew up a different time, a different era. Uh, yeah. You know, we interacted with kids. And yeah, you had, and you had to leave the house to have a nice time. You know, or you played stoop ball. You went down to the park. You played some wiffle ball. You played some handball, some basketball. You played sports. Yep. And if not, you got yourself into some kind of trouble, you know? Yeah, and your mother would on rainy days. Your mother would get out of, you know, she'd be going pulling her hair out of her head. Or they would tell you, get out, go outside, get some fresh air, get out of here, you know? I remember once, I never forget, it's a vague memory, because I must have been like six years old. It was a rainy day, and we went to this one kid's house down the block, and we had G.I. Joe's. 
So we set up our GI Joes all over the basement. Every who's in this one is that one. And I don't know how it jumped off, but I guess somebody picked up a sneaker and threw it at somebody else's GI Joe. And the next thing you know, you had like four or six year old kids just like throwing shit all around the basement. I remember that mother coming down the stairs. What's going on? And I remember just walking back up the street with the other kids going home because she threw us out. <laughs> And, you know, that was that. We had to go downstairs, play with a G.I. Joe, throw rocks at each other, throw crab apples. You know, crab apples? Maybe not broke. Oh, yeah. Yonkers, Rockin Yonkers used to have crab apple fights. They had crab apple trees, little crab apples, and wing them at each other. Catching, uh, like, well, you, Brooklyn, you guys did different things, too. You was a little more urban than Rockland County, you know? Yeah. Rockland? But, uh, yeah. But, Larry, look, we're going into two hours. I really don't want to go too much further. Let's go. Cool, bro. Hey, but the thing is, look, I'm going to have you on again for sure. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. Happy Father's Day to you. You I'll, too. I'll give you a call after the show. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Everybody, say goodbye to Larry. You'll see him again soon. And uh, check out that uh, movie, like I said, uh, Laugh, Killer Laugh. I'm telling you, it's a great movie. Laugh, yeah. And love. you can go to my website if you want to see, like, I guess the trailer's there, maybe. I don't even know what's up there. Music, if they want to hear music. Yeah, and, and, yeah, plug your website again. It's LarryRomano.com. You know, I'm adjusting it as it goes. But there's some music there, little clips on SoundCloud you can listen to. And, um, yeah, cool, man. Hey, it was great, man. Hey, Larry, yeah, I love you. You're the best. Yeah, you too, Thank bro. you so much, and I'll see you soon. See you soon, man. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Larry, you know, guys, I want to thank you all so much for all the super chats you sent me. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, look, I watch the chat as, uh, you know, I talk to my guest. And, you know, there is a couple of negative comments. Thank you, Boston J. Live and let live. I deleted a couple myself. You know, you got some people that always want to disrupt as you're doing well. Like he said, you know what? When you uh, rise above, there's always someone trying to chop you up, you know, and that's exactly what happens. But uh, I want to thank you all for coming in and supporting me and Larry. Listen, Larry's a great guy, and this guy has so much more film in him, you know, to come. Whether he's directing, uh, whether he's going to be acting, you're going to see a lot more of him. And uh, you know what? Pretty soon you're going to be sad. You're going to be watching Saturday in the Park with a uh, Chuck Zito. Larry director and all these other new uh, faces to come. But uh, everyone, listen, have a happy Father's Day. I hope you enjoy it with the people you love. And, uh, you know, until my next video, I love you guys. You guys are the best. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for coming in. I truly appreciate it. With that said, I'll see you guys all soon. I love you guys. Bye, guys. The streets will never make you grow. It's not a seed, it's a gutter. There's no happy endings in this life. So this is my message to you. streets will never love you back.